Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 348 of the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. I'm your host, Anthony Rand, and the show notes are located at continuefit.com or strengthcoachpodcast.com. Sorry for the sound today. I am had some travel, unexpected travel, so I am in my dad's closet in Florida with uh, old school earbuds, so sound won't be as good. Sorry about that. So for today on the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about teaching the breath for core as well as strength training because he doesn't usually do it for strength training, just the core. I wanted to find out why. Talked about his article, plate-based warm-ups and just some considerations for training older adults and how he defines older adults. Don't forget, we did a special interview called 40 Mistakes 40 years. You can get access to that on my site, traincoachpodcast.com or continuefit.com. All right. Hit the gym with the train coach segment brought to you by Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens, 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. You can get a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs which have come in handy this week for me personally, with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash strength coach. Today I got on Pete Holman, long overdue. Pete is a physical therapist and trainer, but he's also the 2022 Idea Fit Leader of the Year. You guys would know him as the fitness product inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer, the Nautilus Glue Drive, the Escape Barrel, which is pretty new, and the Golf Forever Swing Trainer. I talked to him about developing a program style with so many influences. He comes from a martial arts background, so I wanted to find out how that kind of influenced his programming. And then considering mindset training with athletes and clients, Pete's a really high energy guy and really into the mindset, especially with his martial arts training. So wanted to see how he uses that in his training as well. We took a deep dive into how he developed his products, the functional training rack, which is his first product, the TRX rip trainer, the Nautilus glute drive. We're gonna go over the whole process behind the inventions, getting them to market with fabricators, copyrights, licensing, and more great stuff coming up from Pete in a little while. For the Kiss Marketing Business Secrets for Gym Owners with Vince Gabriel, Vince goes over something that every gym owner should have on their list to do next month. Really important, guys. Kiss Marketing is a digital marketing agency that helps fitness business owners make the big bucks from their marketing without feeling stupid, stressed, or wasting valuable time figuring out on their own. If you need some help with your marketing, head over to kissmarketing.net. To book a free coaching call with Will Matheson, Vince Gabriel's secret marketing weapon. For the getting started with VBT segment brought to you by Perch. Perch is a 3D camera based weight room technology solution bringing VBT into the 21st century. This week, Nika speaks about the importance of using goal setting along velocity based training. She's also going to talk about a specific study that was used with VBT and how Perch uses uh, different settings for goal setting as well. Pretty cool. Don't forget, we have a new segment with Nomly, maximizing the member experience with Sumi Seth. This is the second one we've done. We also did a special interview with Sumi, the founder and CEO of Nomly. Great stuff. And don't forget, Nomly is the member experience platform for modern training gyms. It puts all of your communication with your members in one place allowing you to keep track of that communication, which is so important for retention. Go to nomly.com, schedule your demo, and use the referral code SHRINKCOACH to get started on a free 30-day trial. Today, Sumi's going to discuss why the member experience is so important, why you should be thinking about it, and how it correlates to helping you stand out. Guys, don't forget the Perform Better Holiday sale is going on up to 40% off racks and benches and bands, sandbags, cleaning supplies, you name it. And also, guys, the one-day seminars are back starting in July. They're going to be in New Jersey, Austin, L.A., Chicago, and Boston. So excited because, you know, just to keep continuing these live 
seminars and workshops. So important for all of us. Guys, check it all out at performbetter.com. Lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com and nbsc.tv Coaches Corner with Coach Boyle. You can try the new strengthcoach.com out for seven days for free. Totally new format, user-friendly, same great form as always. It's the place where top coaches in the industry come to connect and learn. We're actually going to talk about a couple articles that Coach Boyle has been, that has put on recently on the site. So, Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Ian. How are you? I'm doing all right, all right. You know, it's funny because... You have Patrick McCown. You you just got off the phone with him. You're going to be on his podcast now. He's going to come on uh, our podcast. And I actually had listened to his book back in uh, a couple of years ago on breathing called The Oxygen Advantage. So I'm pretty excited about that. But you had written an article on core training, and I kind of wanted to shift it over to the breathing part, because you said in in the article, breathing is where we really miss the boat on core training. Now, you, can you just talk about like, what about strength? Because, you know, I've done the RKC and the Strong First Training, you know, starting about 11 years ago. And breath was always a big part of it. And really, I, this idea of the skill of strength and using the breath on on uh, in, in a really strategic way. And, and it contributed to me, I can tell you right now, contributed to me lifting heavier loads. To me, it was a game changer. And you were talking about how the deep abdominal muscles assist as air is forced out. So have you, because again, this is really about core training, but if you utilized any of this in your strength training as well we have not utilized it in our strength training no and i think and that was one of the interesting things so patrick spoke to our staff yesterday for an hour and then i spoke to him today for an hour and i think i i just think there's so much that we need to do even before the strength training part just to get i think just figuring out how do we raise the awareness of our athletes what you know he was talking about you know simple breath holds and it's my problem, and we talk about this all the time, but it's that how do I integrate this into training a bunch of 17-year-olds? That's the really difficult part. So I'm not sure. And that's so, you know, you get it's like we talked about, you know, zone two breathing. There's so much of this, what we might look at as the finer points of strength and conditioning. And then when you think if you're training high school kids, it's really hard to get to the finer points because you've got to deal with the the gross framework, as Coach uh, Doug Parker at Springfield College Wrestling used to call it. You know, he'd always be like, hey, Mike, you got the gross framework. And that was his way. I would say that was his way of saying you didn't really do a very good job with that move, but it wasn't terrible. And I feel like that's where we are. So I've actually been struggling with, okay, how am I going to get these guys to even incorporate any breathing at all into what we're doing. I'm trying to figure that part out. And I, we, with core training, we've been doing it, but again, I don't think we do a good enough job. I would say, I would say the majority of our athletes do not understand what we're trying to get them to do. And the reason they don't understand is because they don't care. They don't, it's not important enough to them at this stage of their development. Usually I think the time when people really start to listen to you about core training is when they've got something wrong with their back. And suddenly you're explaining sort of stabilization strategy and why you want them to do this. And they're like, oh, I get it. Oh, I've just been, I've been like nodding my head at you and yesing you to death for the last three years. And then now that my back hurts, I'm actually paying attention to what you're saying. So I think it's difficult. I, I don't have, I don't have an answer, but the, I think you, if you don't have questions, you never get answers. So the fact that I have questions that I have things that I'm thinking about and saying, okay, how am I going to do this is really good. Yeah, I think going back to some of Patrick's stuff in terms of the breath holds, it's also a hard thing to kind of monitor, right? And from a, a coach's perspective, it's really, like you said, they really need to care about it and want to do it because they have to just basically be, uh, uh, really, they're going to end up, the, the majority of this is going to be on their own, right? In the day, are they nose breathing? Are they maybe, you know, we're not, might not want to recommend the taping the mouth, you know, to kids, but, but, you know, like, are they trying to do some of these things that can work on the breath? But for me, I just feel like there's got to be, and hopefully now that Patrick's spoken to you guys, 
maybe there's some people that, you know, some of the coaches and you are going to work towards, I think if you can get them into the strength too, maybe it'll connect in the strength and it'll go back to the core. Like, Oh, I get it. It's helped me in the strength training. Let me try it in the core or let me figure it out. It might, it might bite a bulb off in their head going backwards, like doing it in strength training. Cause sometimes I feel like with people breathing in the core training stuff, sometimes they're breezing through that routine in the beginning, right? They're, they're talking to their friends. They just saw it. They just got in. The guys are kind of like, I know when I had the kids in warming up and everything, they would, a lot of time would be them catching up and while they're foam rolling. The or That's what, I think it's just harder in strength training because again, one of the things, one of my big criticisms of like the strong first RKC, a lot of that stuff was the, like the breathing was so almost obnoxious that it was hard to, you know, you people do it and they would be like, hoo, 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 you know, and you just be like, okay, chill guys. Like, you know, they, like you're swinging a 16 kilo kettlebell over there and, you know, you sound like you're lifting the world. And, but what I realized, and I wrote about this later, what you realize when you're trying to produce that stabilization strategy, the sound matters. That's, it's much the same. I used to, people used to be critical of the, the grunts in tennis. Remember people like, what are they grunting about? And I think, I don't think they were consciously grunting and or consciously trying to stabilize their core or their abdominal muscles or use those muscles of exhalation, but that's what they were doing. So again, I think, I think a lot of this stuff is, is very nuanced and nuance is tough with kids. It really is because it's just, oh, you know, anything that you give them that they can screw around with, they're going to. And so things like, you know, breathing or grunts or things like that, it's going to go downhill fast. It, it always does. So I, I don't, and that's what I said to, uh, I was talking to, to Patrick and he had another guy on there, Daniel with him is that it's not easy. It's, I wish there was a simple solution and I don't think there is a really simple solution. Like, but what about again, go, okay. We're talking about the young athletes, but the rest of your clientele like your adult population you have a good adult population now right you have some the pro athletes the you know all the the the, the girl the female athletes from uh, the pro athletes that you, you train what about them um I, that's what i'm thinking now and that's like i said I, i'm in truth my uh my head is spinning a little bit because because i'm realizing yeah we got to figure out a way to incorporate this more I, the reality is i think the the group that's most likely to be receptive is probably that female professional group. I feel like our adults are probably a lot like the kids in terms of, I, and I use this phrase all the time, but we've got a lot of what I call check the box people. They just wanna come in and get the workout done. And if you start making it too involved and say, hey, I want you to breathe like this, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. They start looking at you like, what, well, stop. You know, we just, you know, how many I gotta do? You know, 10, eight, what is, what's the number? You know, stop bothering me with, you know, my breathing in my nose or out my mouth or what I'm doing, you know, that, that type of stuff. So it's, uh, it's know. true. You're right. I mean, with some of those adults, it's very much about just give me the strength training program here. You know, like I, we don't need to far off to outside the box. It's like for them. And then I do have some people that are all into it. They want to know everything. And when I do certain things, and like you said, I think with some of the strong first type breathing, people can be like, Whoa, you know, cause there's that, you know, there's a lot of that going on and people kind of laugh. And, and so with, especially with adults who are relatively, relatively new, they might think is a little ridiculous. So coach, I want to talk about your plate-based warmups. I mean, it's really uh, a great, I think what happens in, in, in that, in the strength and conditioning field is we talk about percentages a lot and people, you know, kind of want to have this system of kind of going up. And you were talking about using just plates and and i've been doing this forever in terms of i've been sw i switch off between a 10 pound and a 25 pound plate so but i don't go to five reps on the warm-up so i kind of do two to three reps so if it's that if, if i want to get to a guy to 225 or 250 i'll start with the 135 i'll actually add 10s again let's look at my lens a little bit older gentleman uh so i'll add 10s to go to 155 but then i'll replace the 10 with the 25 to go to 185 and then i will add that 10 back on for the 205 take those off and put the 45s on now i know what you're going to say oh that's too much plates back and forth but for me 
for the safety of those guys. And and again, I'm not doing five rounds because like you talked about in the article, hey, if we got to, if we're going and picking up some heavy weight, I don't want to tire them out in the warm up. Can you expand for people on this idea about plate based warm ups? Yeah, I just think it's funny. We just found with our, our, I would say our less experienced coaches or our coaches who probably were not maybe serious lifters themselves that you would see people say things. It's like you, but you said, you know, you're going 155, 185, 205. So you're going 10s, 25s, 25s, 10s. It's easy. It's logical. I think what we're trying to say to people is do what's easy and logical until you get to the work set. Like if, you know, sometimes I'll say, no, the work set, I want 237.5. I want a one and a quarter on there. Do you know what I mean? But in the warm ups, I don't want someone saying, oh yeah, you know, warm up with 90, put the two and a half on with the 25s. Or, you know what I mean? It's like, wait, we don't, we don't need to do that. 95, put the 25s on. Okay, great. Do five reps. All right. You know, whatever. We're going to, you know, 155, go to one third, 115, throw the 10s on, do two or three reps with that. Like you said, it's just trying to get people to realize that, that there's some simple logic to this that will save you a significant amount of time. Like we even, I actually have to film it but when we're deadlifting, I'll just put out bars. I'll put out a 135 bar, a trap bar, a 225 trap bar, a 280 trap bar, a 315 trap bar, and just say to the guys, like, everybody get in the 135 bar and get a warm-up set in. Let's go. And then, you know, whatever. If you're going to 280, jump in the 225 bar and do three, you know, and then go to 280. If you're going to 315, jump in the 225 bar and do three, then jump in the 280 bar and do three, and then go up to the 315 bar. So, our guys, some people be like, they're using four different bars. I'm like, yep, we're using, we've got 12 kids, four bars, and we're just doop, 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 jumping through, and we've got everything set up to make it simple. And I guess that's the whole, you know me, it's always about making it simple. It's always about making it easy for people to do what they need to do. And interesting on this kind of note, you posted about design your facility like a factory, right? And how many likes which is, you know, uh, you didn't create a controversy for once, but um, it was, uh, how many likes did you get on that? Design your facility like a factory. Right? Almost 600. Wow. Which was really funny because I don't even know, something prompted me to throw that up. I must have read somebody else's tweet about something, about sprinting or whatever it was. And I thought, yeah, you really, people, when they're designing, sorry, when they're designing the facility, they really should design a sprint area into the facility. So I actually have a third one. It'll be interesting to see. I have a third one up today on dumbbells by two and a half. But I would say the the first one was designed like a factory. The second one was a sprint area, and that went over 400 likes. So I'll see what dumbbells by two and a half does if that goes over 400 also. But it shows you sometimes people are interested in things that I don't think they're interested in. And so they'll they'll promote like this is going to be I look at my my monthly Twitter interactions and I think. The month I did this, I did a whole series of program design ones. I had, I think I had 3 million Twitter interactions that month. I averaged probably around like a low million, but this series has put me up closer to like 1.6 in terms of the actual, well, however, I don't even know how it works. I just look at the total number just to see, you know, it's, I guess the total number of interactions that you have for a month on all of the tweets that you put up, but I would not have thought that facility design would produce that sort of reaction. Yeah, you you actually, uh, the facility one has 38 likes right now, but I can say that the factory one r- early on had a couple hundred. So it, it yeah, hit right I, I away. At it, I just, because I kept looking, because I, I tweeted when it got for, I was like, wow, 400 likes. And then 400 likes generated like another 80 immediately almost. I don't know why people were like, what did you get with 400 likes? I got to go look at it. And then, yeah, yeah. So, and then I think when I finally went back and looked, the last time I looked, I think it was 576. That that would be, yeah. And for you kids out there listening, that would be Cialdini's uh, social proof trigger. So when people see other people are liking it, more people are like, hey, wait, wait, what's going on over there? And, and then they got to go over, right? That, that would be true too. Mike, you posted a funny one, uh, not funny, but when writing programs for adults, don't assume you know what it feels like if you aren't old. Hint, old is when you go to bed healthy and wake up hurt. That's also going to get a a lot. Talk to me about, because you and I are sitting here saying old is, you know, with whatever, 50s. 
but for some of the kids in the twenties, they look at the thirty-year-olds and and see old. Can you just talk about what what when you say that? What are you talking about? Are you talking about older population adult? Are you talking about hey kids? You know, to your to your staff, like guys, don't forget the guys in the thirties, especially with the pro athletes. Like they they've been through a lot. Yeah, I think what I'm really talking to, to be honest, probably is I'm talking to trainers in their twenties, programming for people probably in their forties and up, because I do think that what ends up happening is people say stuff and they have, I hate to say they have no idea what they're talking about, but they have no idea what they're talking about in the sense that you don't know what it's like to be old if you've never been old. And I get it. People say, yeah, you you can't, there's no way to manufacture that. But I think the way to manufacture that to some degree is to listen to people that are older. And to realize maybe there's a reason that these older people don't want to do certain things. And it's a, I think it's a little bit of a poke at the, the kind of go heavier, go home folks that p- people still think, oh, you know, everybody can squat. It, it, it's just, no, I mean, you can't, you look at somebody like me, I do really well from a feeling good standpoint if I do not pick up heavy weights. I do really badly from a feeling good standpoint if I try to lift heavy things. And that's just the way that it is. And I was having this conversation actually with Bobby, my my partner, and I said, I think what happens when you are strong or when you were strong, you maintain a lot of your ability to lift heavy things, but the connective tissue tends to fail you a little bit. So you end up in a situation where you think, oh, I can pick that up and I can. And then I pick it up and I'm kind of like, oh, that didn't feel good. And so you think, okay, what, what's the limiting factor? The limiting factor for me clearly is not the muscular strength aspect of that as much as it is the connective tissue aspect of that. And I find when I do really, when I end up doing, you know, heavy, even whatever, moving furniture, lifting couches, doing things like that, a lot of times the next day I'll think, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, you know, Mike, too, another thing for people to understand, it, you know, even with my 50 for 50 right now, I've gotten almost, almost everybody has said something about their knees, right? And and like my knee recovery is not going to be the same as Marky's knee recovery. And I think that's a lot of times trainers in their 20s might not understand the recovery piece as well from like some of those events and then over that, that those chronic events, like over time and overuse events, and we're not going to recover or repair like we did when we were younger. That's one. And then number two is even things like I remember when, when bear crawls started to get really popular. And I was like, right away, I was like, Hey guys, we're going to do some bear crawls. But what, you know, another big injury for when you get older can be your wrists. Right. And a lot of people couldn't do those. And I was like thinking, no, everybody can do these. And then realized, no, not everybody can do these. I need to progress these. I need to make sure that they can do them first before I prescribe them. So there's a lot of things that need to be. And I think just being empathetic towards, like you said, just listen and and it'll help. Yes, there's no question. But uh, you, you're absolutely right when you start thinking about the crawling idea, right? I mean, I did that even, I found that with my hockey guys because hockey guys, you know, have tend to have wrist issues. And we you know when we used to do like inchworm and Spider Man and stuff like that. I always by the end of the BU season, half the guys would be walking the length of the turf while the other half did their inchworms or Spider Man's because guys just be like, my wrists don't handle this very well. And like you said, knees. But you have to remember, Anthony. Okay, joints don't wear out; they get better. So the more you use them, the better they get. So that you, if your knees hurt, it's because you're not using them enough. You need to do more squatting. <laughs> so again. There's going to be a lot of offended 30-year-old DPTs that listen to this podcast who are going to realize that, once again, you're fear-mongering and spreading false information about how people age. How do you like that, huh? I do. I love it, actually. I think, <laughs> And I think they're, you're spot on with that last point there. So, Coach, we are going to leave you on this note. <laughs> it's Thanksgiving. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for always being here for all of us. And uh, – helping keep the conversations open. So I appreciate you. Have a great Thanksgiving. I'm always, I am thankful for you every day, Anthony Rana. Hey, this is Vince Gabriel. Welcome to Business Secrets for Gym Owners. You're hearing this specific 
segment, as Anthony calls them, in the month of November, I believe. What I'd like to do is, you know, help you guys out with some time-sensitive stuff and tell you what you should be doing in December to get ready for January. Because in marketing your business, you don't want to all of a sudden start thinking about what you're going to do to get new clients in December, in the month of December. You want to do it ahead of time, right? And so here's just a couple of things for you to think about. One, you just got to block a day to do this. Not even a day. You don't even need a day. But like maybe you block two hours. And you block two hours and you put it on your calendar as uninterrupted time to plan out what you're going to do for marketing in the first quarter of the year. So the first quarter of the year is January, February, and March, right? And so that's, you know, what is called a Q1, right? What are you going to do? And you want to start planning this out in December, maybe even earlier. I like to actually do it in November. But what are you going to be doing uh, for marketing uh, in January, February, and March? And so that's the first step. The first step is actually put it on your calendar. So whenever you're hearing this, let's just say it's, you're hearing this sometime in November. Maybe it's, I don't know, December 5th. I don't even know what day of the week that is or whatever. But let's just say it's December 5th. And from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m., I'm just spitballing here, you are going to sit down and you are going to decide what are you going to do for marketing in January, February, and March. All right. So a couple of things to think about. Uh, one is um, what did you do last year? So a lot of times we like to reinvent the wheel because we're stupid gym owners, right? Me included. And we like to reinvent the wheel and just do new stuff all the time. What you really need to do is find out what works and do that every year and repeat it until it stops working. So let's say you did something in last January, like a New Year's challenge or whatever, right? And it worked. You got like 15 new clients and it went really well. And there were specific emails you sent. Well, here's the thing, what you should do. You should rinse and repeat that. Like, don't, don't try and oh, this year I'm, I'm bored. So I'm going to do that. No, 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 no. Don't do that. You already got something that works. Go, 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 just go do it again. Right. And then look to February and like, all right. Oh, like last year on February was Valentine's day. We did, you know, a, um, bring a friend week on Valentine's day or something like that. And that worked really well. We got, so just like find what worked and then repeat it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what is actually happening in your area? Like in the community, is there, you know, specific fairs, is there specific seminars or workshops and things like that, that you could take advantage of event-based stuff that you could take advantage of. And the final thing is, is and kind of mentioned a couple of these before is are there specific dates that that help you market so valentine's day is one new year's is another um all, all these saint patrick's Day is in there i think in, i think saint patrick's day is in march right all these things are specific um excuses or reasons for you to market your gym but i mean at the end of the day it's like you, you got to prepare for this stuff you can't wait and be like hey what am i going to do to get a client tomorrow no you got to figure this stuff out and think, sit down and think about it ahead of time on, on, on what you're going to do. And I like six weeks before the quarter starts. So for me, and I know you're a little late on this, right? But for me, I like six weeks. So if we're starting to promote on Giant One, I want to do this sit down on November 15th. So I'm a little late on this for you. So you can start in December, right? But sit down and plan what you're doing and, and put it somewhere. Put it on, you know, a whiteboard calendar um, on your wall. Like I, I'm still, I'm old school. Like I put whiteboard calendars on my wall with the marketing plans that we're going to do, or you can put it in Google calendar, whatever, right? All this stuff is really, really important. So hopefully this was helpful. If you want more clients and you want some help with this kind of thing, I have a coaching program that you can get on the phone with somebody that can help you with this. And the best news about it is it'll cost you a friggin' dollar to do 60 days. So you can literally have someone help you plan out your marketing with you um, for a dollar. Um, and all you got to do is go to club.vincegabriel.com and you can get access uh, to a coach. You can get access to a newsletter. You can get access to recorded uh, video seminars that will help you with all specifically to help you get more clients and make more money at your gym. So hopefully 
this uh, was helpful and you go out and you plan, plan, plan um, what you're going to do uh, to blow it up on the first three months of the year. All right. Hopefully this was helpful. The website is club.vincegabriel.com. Peace. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Getting Started with BBT or Velocity-Based Training brought to you by Perch. Perch is a 3D camera-based weight room technology solution bringing BBT into the 21st century. I am Nico Ouellette, and I'm the head of marketing and education for Perch. And in this series on the Strength Coach podcast, we cover all things related to velocity-based training. Today, we are covering the importance of using goals alongside velocity-based training. So how often have you heard someone tell you to set goals and write them down in order to help you achieve them? As tedious as it may sound, intentional goal setting helps focus, adherence, and achievement. A 2015 study by psychologist Dr. Gail Matthews showed that when people wrote down their goals, they were 33% more successful in achieving them than those who formulated outcomes in their heads. Now, how does this relate to velocity-based training? (laughs) I'm glad you asked. In a 2019 study by Stephen Hirsch and David Frost at the University of Toronto, uh, two groups performed four sets of five reps, and one group was instructed to aim for a 1.0 meter per second goal, and the other was instructed to just move the barbell as fast as possible. This is obviously very specific to velocity-based training, but the end result, participants moved significantly faster when they received the target velocity instruction than when they received the move as fast as possible instruction. And in Hirsch's words, an instruction to attain a challenging velocity target may be a more effective strategy to use when attempting to elicit maximum barbell velocities during training relative to the traditional instruction to move as fast as possible. Setting goals helps. Basically, setting lofty goals can help you achieve them. And while that may not be news, BBT devices don't always have the capability to set goals and see if you're achieving them in a clear way. With Perch, you can set four different types of goals with preset threshold or customized and actually see longitudinal goal accuracy in our web application. Tracking if you're achieving your goals can help you set them over time as well and make sure that you're setting goals that are attainable, but also pretty challenging. This information can help you understand if athletes or clients first and foremost are trying hard, and it can help you encourage them to do so with that set goal. And secondarily, if they're lifting the appropriate load for the adaptation that you're looking for. Goal setting is incredibly important inside and outside of the weight room. Make sure that your technology is enabling that too. That is all for today. Thank you for listening. And if you have any more questions about BBT or want more information and special deals, head to perch.fit slash strength coach. That is perch.fit slash strength coach. Thank you. Welcome to Namli's Maximizing the Member Experience segment. My name is Sumit Seth, and I'm the co-founder of Namli. Today, I wanted to share why member experience is really important and how it really correlates to helping you stand out. And trust me, I'm not talking about the usual benefits that might be popping up in your head as a response. Benefits such as results, retention, which will drive more referrals, which in turn will lead to more revenue. Nah, that's a given. I'm going to share the deep why behind this whole concept and tell you how it will impact profitability. So to drive home this aspect, I want to transport you to probably when you are celebrating, say, your fifth birthday. And if you were like me on that day, you probably cut a cake that your mother made from scratch. Fresh eggs, butter, sugar, flour, the whole nine yards. And it probably cost your mother maybe a dollar, but a lot of time and love. Let's not forget that. Now, by the time you probably turn 10 years old, Your mom was probably no longer making cakes from scratch, but were using pre-mixed ingredients. Good old Betty Crocker, for which she paid about $3, three times the dollar that she spent on your fifth birthday. You, my friend, were then living in the era of goods-based industrial economy. Later, say when you got to being 15 years old, when the service economy took hold, your parents ordered cakes from the bakery or grocery store which at $10 to $15 cost 10 times as much as the packaged ingredients. And in the time star of 2000s, parents were neither making the birthday cake nor even throwing the party. Instead, they spent $100 or more to outsource the entire event to Chuck E. Cheese that staged this memorable event for the kids and often threw in the cake for free. 
That, my friend, is how you welcomed and arrived at the experience economy. And on digging deeper, you'll find there are really four stages. The commodity stage, which was where the ingredients were sold, to the goods stage, where the packaged goods were sold, Betty Crocker, the service stage, where you delivered the cake, the bakery, to the experience, which is good old Chuck E. Cheese. Drawing a similar corollary, that is exactly how the progress has happened in the fitness world. We started out as selling the place where you go and work out, which is a commodity now, to the actual workout itself, which is really the good stage, to then the program that was delivered by the coach or instructor as the service stage. You can no longer just think of selling the workout or delivering a great program. Those, my friends, are broadly speaking commodity items, table stakes, where the differentiation is all about price. Whereas what you really need to do is to stage the experience so you move away from price conversations and get into the concept of economic value, where the big driver is to save time and pull on the emotional strings of the buyer. And when you do, you can demand a higher price, which in the same way results in that higher profitability. So do me a favor and welcome in this experiential economy in your own settings, for if you truly want to command a higher price and a higher profitability, you got to stop selling workouts. That's it for today. My name is Sumit Seth, co-founder of Namli. For more info, please check out namli.com. You can schedule a demo to get a feel for what it's all about and how we can help in ushering in that member experience. Use, Use the, the referral code STRENGTHCOACH to get started on a free 30-day trial. All right, guys, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment brought to you by Athletic Greens. 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. I use it every day. For me, it fills the gaps in my nutrition. I always talk about certainly use it early in the morning after maybe a couple bourbons. Uh, I feel like it helps me kind of get back on track. Now, Athletic Greens is going to give you a one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. If you can see a different background here, if you're watching some of this and in, in the uh, on YouTube, uh, I'm actually I'm tra I'm traveling myself right now. I did bring the travel packets, so but they're going to give you with your first purchase that stuff. And then I highly recommend getting the subscription. 20% off. You can cancel or skip at any time. Go to athleticgreens.com slash strength coach athleticgreens.com slash strength coach all right today this is long overdue i got pete holman on pete's a physical therapist certified strength and conditioning former u.s national taekwondo champion he was actually the team captain he won 2022 idea fit leader of the year he's like uh, just a fitness product inventor, like just out of control, TRX rip trainer, Nautilus glute drive, golf forever swing trainer. He's got the escape barrel that's just coming out now or last couple months. So uh, this is exciting. He's even an author. He wrote a book called Cruise. So Pete, <laughs> thanks for doing this, brother. I'm so excited. And actually, I rarely get nervous for these things. But I, to be honest, I'm a little nervous. I was looking at your last couple of podcasts and it was, you know, Mike Boyle and Charlie Weingroff. And I'm I'm going, oh, man, I better bring my A game today. So excited to be here. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to it. All right, man. Well, you know, that that's the thing is I think everybody brings something so different. And I was talking earlier. I mean, first of all, anybody that, you know, let's listen to that 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 bio, you know, you you're a physical therapist you had your own place uh that you had your own practice you were taekwondo champion uh you've been you've had all you you've kind of really done so much and i think it's so important for the listeners because they always say like uh, no one retires a strength coach right man and you know <laughs> we need we need these other things we need these additional revenue streams we need to kind of always be open to opportunity. But I want to take a step back because again, with that resume, Pete, I just feel like, and you've worked with so many different kinds of people. 
Um, and and I, I, like when you have so many different styles and influences, like all of these, like being a therapist, being a certified strength and conditioning specialist, being into martial arts as heavily as you are in, how do all these influences manifest into your program? Can you just talk a little bit about your programming style, what maybe like you bring to the table for that? Well, what I love about physical therapy is it's all goal oriented, right? So if somebody comes in and they're a drywaller, well, we should, you're going to have to do overhead stuff, right? Because they're hanging drywall all day. Uh, and it, maybe they got a shoulder injury. If somebody comes in and they're 72 years old and they're all they want to do is get to the mall and back, you know, you're looking at sit to stand, you're looking at balance training, you're looking at ambulation training. So it's all goal driven. And one of the things, it's very interesting. So I came up not dissimilar to a lot of us in, in you know, the Venice Beach era, right? Like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the the modern encyclopedia of modern bodybuilding like, was my my go to. And so I did all this hypertrophy training and I wanted the body beautiful. I wanted to be big and strong like a lot of you know, dudes back in the day. As soon as I made the U.S. National Taekwondo team, I started training so heavily in Taekwondo. I mean, it was eight days a week, right? And, and what happened is I noticed every time I would do squats, which I was told was a gold standard, like you better do some kind of squat. It could be a goblet squat. It could be a front squat. It could be a back squat. It could be a Bulgarian sp split squat, but you got to be doing squats. Well, all of a sudden, I noticed every time I did a, 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 a squat workout, I was sore for four days. Now, granted, maybe I was training at too high of an intensity. Maybe my volume was too high. You know, I was a young punk. I didn't really understand volume and, and, and rest periods. <laughs> and I, you know, I would do plyometrics like three days a week. I mean, I just was an idiot. But at the same time, I would be so sore. And I noticed my speed re really was at a deficit when I would do deadlifts or squats or bench press. You know, I'm trying to punch. My coach would say, faster, faster, you know, like you're a samurai warrior, go faster. And I, and I started to peel away some of those strength training lifts. And I focused more on Olympic lifts. I focused more on medicine ball work. Um, and I, I focused more on power stuff. And what happened is I got faster. I didn't lose any strength. And I gained power. And it was the first time in my kind of athletic career that I realized programming really does matter. You can't just throw a cookie cutter at somebody. Now, granted, if I was a lineman playing Division I uh, college football, well, you've got to put you've got to have those hypertrophic changes. You've got to have size. You've got to have that crazy strength. But as a martial artist in a specific weight division, I couldn't be over 201 pounds. I had a very different uh, parameters on my strength and conditioning program. So it was the first time I really looked at goals and, and trying to match my goals to specific clients. And it's hard to do because what we like to do is everybody comes in and you spit them into this workout and every single person's doing, you know, all your basic lifts, your power lifts and, and, and your sled pushes and all that stuff. But uh, you've got to differentiate yourself and you got to differentiate in your programming to be a, a su successful and effective and efficient. Yeah, it's so true. And I love what you said is, is really what's that common thread among people, right? They all have a goal. Like they, so there, there's that, there's that goal. We have to get that out of them. We had Brian, Dr. Brian Yee on. He really talked like when he goes extensively into, into their background and their history and really what they're there for. Right. And, and, that, and, and it's not until that, that he really starts to design the program and look at those things. And I think you know, what, like what you said is a lot of times we, I don't know if it's people get trainers, get scared, you know, or, or they feel like you, like you said, you got to differentiate yourself. You feel like, and, and so you start to think about you and your program. And I feel like we lose sight of, of what they're there for. Would you agree? 100%. Now keep in mind, there are some foundational things that I do with almost every client. I don't care if that's a senior citizen or an elite level athlete, I always focus on hip mobility and hip strength. If you're not doing something in, in a triplanar motion on the hips for, for strengthening, uh, including balance work, um, you're missing the boat. If you're not doing something for ankle strength and stability, my daughter now is an elite level volleyball player. And for the first, she just turned 16. So for the first time she started working out, 
And I, you know, I'm trying to back away, you know, it's, I'm not that dad, I'm not that guy, but at the same time, I'm like, I've got so much knowledge about what you should be doing. Well, she keeps rolling her ankles. So imagine a 16 year old, she's kind of got my physique. I mean, big, strong quads, big, strong glutes, powerful lats. I mean, she can crush the ball, but her ankles, you know, are a little bit of a weak link. And all those global positioners that overpower some of those smaller intrinsic muscles in the ankles. So, you know, I'm telling, I finally got her a, a trainer and I'm telling the trainer, hey, you know, sh sh just get a little ankle stuff going with her. You know, some dorsiflexion, you know, heel to toe rockers, maybe some single leg balance calf raises, just some basic, maybe some foot, um, you know, shoeless training and bare feet to get those intrinsic longitudinal muscles of the arch of the foot strong, because that's going to help her prevent ankle injury. So there's some basic stuff I do with everybody. And it's, you know, it's some variation of a side plank, some variation of a glute bridge or a hip thrust. If you've got the access to the Nautilus glute drive, uh, I definitely some big farm strong exercises, some kind of a push on a sled, some kind of a retro walk, like a drag on a sled, some kind of a loaded carry. These to me are non-negotiable lifts. And sometimes they suffice. I mean, I used to be really big into Olympic lifts because I it was it's just a beautiful thing to watch, right? If you see somebody get under there and like throw that thing around, um, the problem is those the learning curve on Olymp Olympic lifts is pretty significant. Do you have to have the Olympic lift under your belt to be a high level athlete? Not necessarily. So you got to kind of pick your poison. Do, do you want to spend more time in skill acquisition, for instance, with their skill specific coaches do you want to spend more time building those foundational pillars of the core and the and shoulder health and maintenance uh or do you want to double down on olympic lifts so i'm not saying yay or nay on that i just it's it's a thought process like i i put in a sled push a, a retro drag a loaded carry and yes some kind of explosive uh, move that's a little bit easier to teach you know whether it's a box jump or um uh the, the velocity, I'm trying to think of um, Vertimax, uh, you know, some kind of Vertimax machine. Or it's, you know, definitely you want to work on explosive power, but uh, programming is a tough one. And, you know, you, you got to have some foundational pillars, but you also got to think outside the box and really meet the client where they are and, and match their goals to the program itself. Don't get lazy out there, strength coaches. It, it's so true, Pete. And that's 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 a big part of it is – the laziness, but also I think a lot of times, and and to your point about the Olympic lifts or, you know, hard to teach. Some people, will, some coaches are like, that shouldn't be the excuse. Well, <laughs> when you only have somebody for a certain amount of time, and if you're working with some, some athletes who, some higher level athletes who are going to be you know, let's say they're, they're, they're going to go on the ice that night, or they're going to train, or they're going to be on the field that night. There's certain things that you cannot do and you have to kind of pull back. So a lot of times it, it's not it's not always laziness, but it is many times, too. But then it's also what else are they doing and looking at right, would you, looking at what do they need going back to this idea about goals? What is and I like what Mike talks about is, uh, you know, the, the, first of all, the bucket idea. And but then again, not just the bucket idea with with what we're doing in the gym, but is somebody else filling those buckets? So are they doing speed work on the volleyball court? Is your door, you know what I mean? Like, is, are they working on the ankle, which obviously they're not, but, but you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, it's not only the boxes you're or buckets you're trying to fill. It's those bu buckets that others, and you can really understand that with the martial arts, what are they getting filled in those activities? Well, well, two points right there that are, that, uh, are prominent. Number one is, so I'm, I'm working now at Lauren Landau. Lauren Landau is the strength coach for the Denver Broncos. And he's got a place called Landau human performance or Land, it's, I'm sorry, it's Landau performance in Denver. And it's just an amazing facility. It's where my daughter's training and they have their, their coaches are just, you know, they're, they're mentored by Lauren and he's, he's just a brilliant mind um, in strength and conditioning. And he's got, they've got a slew of mixed martial artists in there. If for people that don't know, Denver is kind of a hub now for martial arts. It used to be all Albuquerque, New Mexico, or, or, you know, top team down in, uh, you know, Florida, you know, Coconut Grove in Florida. And there's some stuff in California. Um, 
and kickboxing stuff. But Denver now is pretty big. And so you go into Lauren Landau's and any given day, you know, you see Justin Gagey and all these guys. And it's it's really interesting. And I just puts a smile on my face because you think, OK, what are they doing? I'm watching them closely. They're doing single leg glute bridges. They're doing Copenhagen side planks. They're doing, uh, you know, RDLs. They're like nothing sexy, nothing super dynamic, nothing. Uh, you know, they do some box jumps and stuff, but it's just very measured and calculated um, programming, which which, again, makes me think. You know, and and they never like really empty the tank. And so part of me is thinking, you know, I used to train and I'm like, come on, guys, like, when are you going to go ballistic? When are you going to train not just your physicality, but your mindset? Um, but guess what? They're probably going to a striking practice that night. They might be sparring that night or the next day. They, I mean, these strength coaches, their number one job and your number one job is don't jack the athlete up. That's the number one goal. Do not get them injured. Do not overtrain them. Do not you know, have them end up with a shoulder pathology or, or a, a low back injury. So they're just getting them primed up. But I will say, so I've watched this for now a month and a half. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, come on, you got to work a little Bushido in there, you know. And sure enough, the last workout, it was cardio. And you could tell they, they put the, the pedal down. And, I'm, and it thought, I thought to myself, I guarantee they're not sparring tonight. I guarantee they're not, you know, having high level rolling sessions tonight. This is the day for whatever reason in their scheduling, they're going to work on that physicality, building capacity with their cardio system and also a little bit of mindset training. Because, as you know, at at a high level, at some point, you got to enter those dark spaces and you got to push yourself past what's comfortable. Um, You know, so that so that was you know, I've, I had a second point there and it's escaping me uh, right now. It'll come back. I, w- I want you to kind of, I want to shift that. I want to talk about some of your core training, but, but I, you mentioned mindset and, and a, a couple times actually, and I know it's important to you and I know the energy you bring, like when anybody sees you uh, speak or on video, the energy that you bring, it, it's an important piece for you. Talk to us about how you are including some mindset training in, in your in your sessions. It's challenging. Everybody's different, right? And if you if you guys follow uh, guys and gals, if you follow Brett Bartholomew, he talks about conscious coaching, and he's he's kind of a young. Um, I, I really like Brett. I've never met him. I've read his book. Um, I follow him. What I like about Brett is he thinks outside the box, and he's trying to break some of these old school paradigms. It's not just about the X's and O's of strength and conditioning and putting them through their proper program. It's about connecting with your athletes. It's about building rapport. It's about finding their weak spots and and bringing out the best in the athlete. And that's what any coach, their number one job is to do that. And the way you do that is you obviously you got to be your authentic organic self, but you also have to step outside the box. You can't just sit back with your arms crossed with a clipboard and, you know, count reps. That's not what we're designed to do. We're designed to, um, you know, be coaches, but also befriend our athletes. And so I look at it more as like a sensei versus a coach, right? A sensei is that mentor that uh, brings out the best in the athletes, brings out something that they didn't even know they had themselves. So that's what I focus on is building rapport. Um, I, I, challenge my athletes um, constantly and I challenge them in multiple ways. Sometimes it's physically, sometimes it's mentally. Um, sometimes when the time's needed, it's, it's being light and being, you know, uh, being jovial with them, right? Just having that ability, you know, you can tell when athletes come in and something's going on, right? And you don't make it a big deal, but at some point during the session, you know, you pull them aside, hey man, everything cool? I noticed, you know, your energy is a little different today. I'm, I'm in, you know, concerned about you. I want, I want the best for you. And the next thing you know, you find out they got problems at home. They got problems with a, a significant other. They got, and just building that rapport over time, you're going to get so much more out of your athletes. So it's, it's just a lot of mindset. It's one thing, you know, to, to say it. It's another thing to do it and engage in it. And not everybody has that personality. My background's in psychology. I wanted to be a psychologist. Both my parents were PhD psychologists in different levels. And that's what I was on track to become. And then I talked to my mom, to be honest, I talked to my mom about some of her sessions and she would you know, talk about 
kids that had been abused and, and some of the real life scenarios you're going to deal with. And I like, I just, I just couldn't handle it. You know, I, I, so I said, this is not for me. It's too intense. I, I don't know. I can't respond to people that have been abused like that. And I would, you know, I'd want to go search these people out. You know, <laughs> I have all these weird thoughts were going through my mind. So I said, you know what, you know, let me shift. And at that time I tore my ACL skiing and I grew up in Colorado skiing at a high level and wanting to be the next Warren Miller, you know, ski star. And so I blew out my ACL and I was in seeing a physical therapist and their knowledge about the body and the, the rehabilitative process and how they worked with my knee and got me back to full health. I fell in love with physical therapy. And the next thing I know, I, I changed my trajectory and became a physical therapist. And that, that really changed the course of my life, getting into therapy and getting into martial arts and um, really exposed me to martial arts, exposed me to strength and conditioning, right? Because I wanted to be the fastest, most explosive, most accurate, most flexible, most agile person on on the mats at any one time and i really i knew i had to learn more about strength and conditioning so that's where it just kind of yeah it just it, it evolves like that and i think some of the best strength coaches are some of the guys that have been through in one form of another kind of been there done that understand what they're going through because going back to this point about programming and really being empathetic and understanding being aware we had Danny Foley on last episode, and he was talking about using time blocks for his uh, sets. So instead of saying we're going to do five sets of five today, he really kind of leaves it open to it could be five sets of three that day. It might be seven sets of five that day. So he's really going to take like what you just said about being aware of that athlete looking at, you know, wait a minute, something's up. And saying I, something, I got to change this. I got to redirect because everything you don't always have to go by what you wrote down because you really don't know. Especially he's talking about working with with a lot of uh, tactical athletes, some military, and you're. I think I think the, the MMA and and the some of the martial arts guys are the same thing. Like you don't know did they get hurt yesterday, so you had a plan, and now you have to go and make a left turn. <laughs> it's so I uh, so. A quick story. I'm I'm working with All Pro Sports and Entertainment, and that's a that's a firm out of Denver. This is years ago, and we were training a bunch of high level athletes. Jerome Bettis, if you follow the Pittsburgh Steelers over the last twenty, you know the, he was the bus, and Willie Rofe was a blindside tackle for the New Orleans Saints, and we had, anyhow we had a, a slew of these top level guys, and they came in for a workout, and we had this whole thing. I mean, we were geeked out on programming at that time. I was big in the Doc Crease. You guys probably don't even know who Doc Crease is, but Doc Crease was a strength coach for the CU Buffaloes uh, back in the day. And I love Doc Crease. And I, we would have conversations uh, and, and talk about programming. So I had this elaborate, you know, basically hour and a half program worked out. These guys came in. They were so tired. They were so uh, worn out physically and mentally. And I, you know, I kind of was like, what do I do? You know, I, I can't do anything. And I was going to do all this intense, um, you know, circuits with, uh, you know, lower body, upper body, core work. And I pulled, there was a yoga instructor that had just finished the class. And I said, hey, Lisa, I need your help. And she said, what? I said, I want you to take these guys through the, the best spiritual recovery yoga session you have ever delivered. And I said, guess what, guys? We're doing yoga today. And they they looked at me like I was an alien. Yoga. This was back in the day. They're like, "What? Are you kidding me, man? I don't, I don't do yoga." And we got in there. She put some candles on. We had this like spa music going. And I jumped. You know, I jumped in with them. And I'm telling you, an hour later, these guys were smiling. They're like, "Coach, that was unbelievable." You know, of course, Lee, it didn't hurt that Lisa was a very attractive yoga instructor. But I mean, they <laughs> were they were bought into this, and it just really opened my eyes that got to be pliable you got to be able to adjust on the fly and and that was a great learning moment for me as a coach i love it i think again going back to this awareness you're you have you know your eyes are wide open here and you're not stuck in in one kind of direction and, and i think it's a good segue into pete holman the inventor you know <laughs> because you know if we look we can't you can't develop, and a big problem with businesses, if you talk to uh, business consultants, a lot of times 
reasons why a business might fail is because people develop the products first instead of looking at the need. So instead of saying, you know, the guy who invented um, uh, Whiteout, for example, right? He was, uh, they were having problems on the typewriter and they wanted to correct it. And he came up with a good way to do that with a little paintbrush and, white, you know, whitening out and then going back on the typewriter, which kids today won't even understand what that is. But, um, but you have to look, you have to be open. We're on the Strength Coach podcast right now. And I did tell the story for our anniversary issue. And the Strength Coach podcast really happened because I had my eyes open for an opportunity. Coach Boyle was starting strengthcoach.com. I had a relationship with him. And I said, Mike, here's a great way to promote your new site. It's called a podcast. You probably, I know you don't need to know what it is. You just need to answer the phone twice a month. We'll talk about the site. So for me, when everybody else was complaining about some stuff about, oh, now we got to pay for the site because Mike's original forum was free. Everybody was, you know, giving a hard time. I was thinking, no way, this is awesome. But I also saw the need. He's going to need to promote this. So let's talk about your your first invention. Let's start it from there. What was your first invention? Was it the Rip Trainer? No, it actually, nobody knows this except Chris Poirier from Perform Better. He okay. knows this. Um, I was a physical therapist in Aspen and I was working at a clinic, my first clinic. And I noticed every time I went to get a foam roller or an elastic resistance tube uh, or a tilt board, you know, it was stuff was all over the clinic. I couldn't ever find anything. And then we had this functional training area that literally looked like a hurricane, like the Tasmanian devil had gone through there. And I just thought, you know, this is a professional, you know, therapy site. Like, what is going on? We need to, to organize all this gear. And I thought to myself, couldn't there be a simple rack that, you know, stores and organizes all this stuff? And so I literally went to a Carbondale and, uh, excuse me, to a fabricator in Carbondale, which is a kind of a suburb of Aspen where I was living at the time. And I said, hey, Take a look at this medicine ball rack. I want a medicine ball rack on steroids. I want to have some antennas that come out the top that have little J hooks where you can hold spore cords and we can organize all the spore cords from different, you know, light, medium, heavy, et cetera. I want the, the rack to be at a more of an angle. So behind the rack, you could put a BOSU ball and we can have that kind of stored away in the, behind the rack. I want some little cans that come out that you can put a foam roller in or a stretching mat. And I want a hoop that comes out on one side of the rack that you could place a stability ball on, right? And we could even stack them. We could have multiple stability balls. So we, you know, we kind of Frankenstein this thing up. And actually it was very expensive to be honest. You, you know, it's Carbondale. So this guy was making fences for billionaires, you know, for their farm and stuff. And, he, and But he worked with me and he kind of gave me the locals discount and we came out with this rack and it was beautiful. And I took it to my first trade show it was in 2008, I went to the Ursa Trade Show, which is the International Health and Racket Sport Association Trade Show. So if you ever are geeked out on equipment, you go to Ursa. It's once a year, and you see the latest and greatest of every squat cage and, and you know new widget and gadget. And so I go to Ursa, and I sold out of all the products. One guy bought three racks. He was a he was a strength coach uh, and therapist for baseball uh, players in Arizona, and he loved the concept. And the problem is in 2008, if anybody's old enough to remember, we had an economic recession and gas prices doubled, oil pr uh, shipping prices doubled. Uh, you know, it was crazy. And I came to Chris Poirier from Perform Better and kind of limped away from the deal, gave him all my inventory and said, hey, can I just that was my first licensing model. Um, but but the point is, I wanted to fill a need. Right. I, there was a problem and I came up with a solution. It wasn't I want to make money. I want to create the next thing to be famous and popular. I just was pissed off about the, the functional training space in our clinic. And that's pretty much how all my products were iterated. The next product was the TRX Rip Trainer. And I was training an X Games athlete, uh, a snowmobile athlete in Aspen who had low back pain and wanted to increase his core strength. And I'm laying on my bed one day and I look up and I see my closet rod. And for I don't know why this came across my mind, Anthony, but I'm like, that looks like a snowmobile handle. I wonder, and I just ripped all the clothes off of it, ripped the closet rod off the rack, went down to my garage, screwed an eye bolt in one end, and I'm a big elastic resistance guy. 
that's maybe for another conversation, but I love the force velocity curve and the eccentric loading on elastic resistance. So I put an elastic resistance cord on one end of this, this lever bar and I attached it to a ski rack in my garage. And I started pushing and pulling. And, you know, with my martial arts, I started striking with this thing. And 10 minutes later, I'm soaked in with sweat. All my core muscles are fired up from head to toe. I feel like my balance is on point. I felt like a ninja warrior training. And I said, this is pretty cool. I, this, this could be something. I took it to my buddy, Mike Schultz, who was training for the X Games. By the way, he's like a five times gold medalist in the X Games now. And he started training with it. And we were just doing basic moves like lateral shifting under load with the asymmetrical load as if he was on a snowmobile. And he said, there, uh, there's never been anything that applied so much to my sport. And, you know, a little geeked out on functional, you know, sports specific training. But, man, did it fire the core and challenge his balance and, and help with his posture. And then he left um, back to Minnesota and he said, hey, can I can I have that? you know, that thing you developed. And all of a sudden I got real possessive. I'm like, that's, that's my only one. <laughs> and of course he was such a great guy. I said, of course you can have it, take it with you. And then that's when I realized I've got something. If, if a high level X games athlete wants to take my dingy prototype, which was literally a closet rod and a sport cord, then I'm onto something. And I, of course, I took the leap of faith. I started to produce a small run. I got some help. I built a team. There's a, there's a bunch of steps you have to go through if you want to become an entrepreneur uh, in any business, um, built a website, tried to secure some capital. And then the next thing you know, it, we were on fire. We One of my buddies went to Necker Island. He was hanging out with Richard Branson. Um, you know, again, another long story, but, you know, Aspen Connection. Sometimes you, this stuff happens. And Richard Branson at the time was training to kite surf the English Channel or some crazy like virgin you know, thing he was doing. So he, so my buddy puts it in his hands. It's connected to a palm tree in, in Necker Island. And Richard Branson's like, this is amazing. I'm going to get you in touch with the head guys at Virgin Atlantic or Virgin uh, Active, which is their, their health club chain in Europe. And the next thing you know, we, my original company, Ripcore FX, we were in Virgin Active a, in a major chain in, in the UK selling these Ripcore um, trainers. And the next thing you know, TRX started kind of courting us and saying, hey, this is a pretty neat product. It might be a nice symbiosis between, you know, our suspension trainer straps, fitness anytime, anywhere. Now we've got a rotational, uh, you know, strength, balance, rotational power device. And, you know, that was that's how that started. So it's always been to fulfill a need and solve a problem. I love this. This is awesome. Pete, let's let's take a step back, though, because I, you know, you talked about with the rack, okay, you went to a fabricator because basically you didn't even have a prototype, like at least with the with the rip trainer, you were like you had your your little version of it. Yeah. What, can you just take us not not deep, not too deep, obviously, because we know I know there's a lot of steps, but so at the end of the day, are you going back to the fabricator to say, I want to make this, let's make a prototype? Do you then um uh, uh get a patent for it? Uh can you just kind of go through like a, a you know, low level, uh, like list yes. of steps that you went through for that? Yeah, I love this question, Anthony, because it's the most frequently asked question I get. People all the time on LinkedIn say, hey, I've got this idea for a product. So the first thing I always say, first of all, you got to build it. Like, does it work? Does it do what it's supposed to do? And so I always start with a prototype. I might do some researching on the United States Patent and Trademark Office to see if there's patents on a similar product. And you can type in keyword searches and you can t actually just go to Google. You know, I did this on my Nautilus glute drive, which is a plate loaded hip thrust machine. I kind of Googled, you know, hip thrust machines and and to see what's out there. But, you know, in, in conjunction with that, you have to build a prototype. Does it work? Does it do what it's supposed to do as advertised? And so for my glute, my plate loaded hip thrust machine, I literally ordered a bunch of uh, exercise equipment, like old benches from eBay. And I took this down to my fabricator in Carbondale and we started to Frankenstein this machine up. I mean, it it looked it was unfinished. It was it had different color schemes. Um, the foot plate was small and, and undersized and it just was very unpolished. But as soon as I got on that thing and put the seatbelt on, if you don't know what 
the glute drive is Google Nautilus glute drive. It's a plate loaded hip thrust machine for glute activation. It's basically a glute, glute bridge on steroids. It gives you more range of motion and you can actually put lots of weight on to, to really not just activate the glutes, but strengthen, uh, strengthen the glutes. So I've got this Frankenstein machine. And the second I strapped that seatbelt on and started to go into that kind of hip hinging motion, and I felt my glutes pop. And I looked at the fabricator because he doesn't really know strength and conditioning. And I mean, I had this look on my face like, oh, dude, this feels so good. And it was there's something about when you do a hip thrust off just a normal bench and you've got a barbell on your lap. It's it's great. But there's something about that articulating back pad that just kind of helps you groove a perfect hip hinging motion. And it's almost impossible to not activate your glutes. Sometimes your low back gets too much involved into it, you know, on a traditional hip thrust. But with this, this back pad, it just felt so buttery and smooth. So the second thing is I build the product. Then I start saying, well, if this is a product that I want to launch, I do, I would like to have some intellectual property rights on it, right? So I start to investigate patents. This is where most people, it blows their mind because number one, a patent attorney, they're 400 bucks an hour. I mean, if, if if not more. So, you know, hopefully maybe you've got a client, maybe you've got a friend, maybe you've got an angel investor that that loves what you do and, and says, you know, I'll I'll give you five or ten thousand dollars for a small equity share in your company, and you can start to investigate and hire patent attorneys because you do want some intellectual property. So then you you know, you file a patent, which is a huge elaborate process. But during that process, you learn how to iterate the machine so you're more protected with your IP. And also sometimes during that process, you figure out tweaks that need to be made on the machine to make it more efficient, more effective, more functional. Um, and then once you've done that, you know, then at some point you've got to, you know, launch a startup. I mean, even if it's a Kickstarter campaign, which I'm not saying I recommend, but a very basic website with a, a shell some content, you know, you can film content on your iPhone, 4K resolution. I mean, you can film anything you want and edit it on your phone now. Uh, so you got some sexy, you know, sizzle reels and you go to all your friends in the industry, you get them a product, they put it on social media and you're up and running. I mean, I, it makes, I'm making it sound easy, but it is kind of as simple as that. Once you get into digital e-commerce, it's pretty intense because the algorithms for Facebook and Instagram and pay per clicks have really changed. It's very expensive, but I'm I'm about to well I'm trying to launch my next product, which is a really cool glute training product. I'm big on the glutes, if you haven't noticed. The powerhouse of the core, man. If you're not training the glutes, you're in in trouble. Um, so it's a glute training product, and I'm in the process of launching this. And now I actually. Everybody, all the my investors are like, it's going to be so expensive for sales and marketing and advertising and, and e-commerce has changed. And what they don't know is that I know so many people in the industry that would be happy to receive one of my products and test it and to film it on and put it out on social media and let them know, hey, my buddy, Pete Holman, he's done some pretty cool stuff in the industry. Here's his latest product. What do you think? They don't even have to maybe endorse it. They can just say, what do you think about this? Is this a viable product? Would you ever buy this? And the next thing you know, within two or three days of a social media campaign, it, millions of people have seen the product. Now, it's only taken me 30 years to you know build my name up and get that reputation. Um, and I'm still, you know, to be honest, I'm still just kind of a peon when it comes to social media. There's there's uh, much better looking, more ripped, more athletic guys and gals out there that overnight have 200,000 followers. So it's it's a slug fest. I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. And if you're authentic, if you're organic, if you really are trying to solve a problem in the industry, you've got a chance. Pete, if, I'm, if I don't live in Carbondale, um, how do I go <laughs> about getting the fabricator, first of all? So because I think that's an important first step. Number one is obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, I got to I got to kind of get this prototype or something made so I can show some angel investors. I could do some, uh, uh, you know, testing on it. What, what exactly. why should I Google, you know, uh, a, you know, fabricator in Indianapolis? Is that what like would be my next step? Absolutely. I mean, there's mechanical engineers are you need somebody. 
well, there's a couple of different. So mechanical engineers are very good at creating things and making prototypes. Some of them uh, understand computer aided design, CAD design. Some of them don't. There's also designers. Some of the designers don't understand what the mechanical engineers understand. So sometimes you have to literally have a graphics designer create kind of like a, uh, you know, uh, bring it to life. So it's a 3D rendering. Maybe all the specifications aren't perfect, but it, it brings your product to life. It shows some color schemes, maybe even some branding. That makes it look sexy and it looks very good in a deck if you have some 3D renderings and they even have basic functions that open the prototype up or fold it down or, you know, it's like a digital animated little short movie. Looks very sexy. Then you also have to go in conjunction with that to a mechanical engineer that can build something. They can bend steel. They can cut and weld steel or aluminum, or maybe it's injection molding that you need. So you might have to go to more of a specialized um, prototyper that can can make hard plastic molds and, and do things like that. Keep in mind, you can. there's something called 3D printing now. My latest prototype it's the third iteration. It literally has 3D printed parts that came off. Like, I still don't understand this, Anthony. It, the world blows me away. You've got a freaking computer and a cell phone. I, that blows me away. And you can, you can, out of a computer, you spit in this, you know, computer-aided design graphic and a part comes out that's literally made out of thin air. And it's it becomes a functional part of my prototype. And to be honest, they're quite strong. I've been using this prototype for a year and a half with explosive, you know, like hockey type moves, um, lateral and sprint type moves, and it hasn't fallen apart. It's just unbelievable. So you can print up your prototype in a lot of instances or take it to a mechanical engineer and have it bent and welded and molded to your perfection. So cool. Yeah, because I know there's a lot of us out there that have, you know, kind of come up with certain, pro you know, certain ideas, like you said, like, man, I wish I had a rack that was specifically like this, but sometimes you need it, but maybe other people don't need it or don't feel that they need it. Right. And that's going to be in the marketing. We have to kind of convince them sometimes that they need something. So when you're doing this and, and, and because, all right, let's just go with the rip trainer. For example, the rip trainer is about a hundred and let's say close to $150 on at Dick's you can get it. Right. That's a good price, but with all of this startup and all of these things, I mean, there's distribution, there's all of these things. You, I know, as we talked about, you you license the rack to perform better. You license the uh, the rip trainer to TRX. TRX. Would that be kind of the second, the business goal? Now, I know it wasn't the original goal for you. Like, oh, I'm going to make, right. I'm going to find a product that TRX would buy for me. But how does that work for you? Would that be the goal? Would that be like, hey, I'm not big enough for this distribution or I don't want to get involved in that. I want to stay in doing this. So I'm going to let someone else take it and just kind of sell it. Yeah, it's well, first of all, two things you said that that um, are important. One is that, of course, my goal was not to make money. But you know what? It's about damn time that strength and conditioning coaches make some friggin money. We pour our hearts and our energy and our passion and our souls into what we do it is a craft that takes years to, to manifest itself. It takes broken joints. I mean, I've got every joint in my body friggin' hurts because of all the experimentation and, and the knowledge I've gotten over years of yeah. doing it myself. Yeah. And it's about time we make some money. So it's okay Amen. to charge like you're a professional in, in your, in your craft and you're one of the best in your craft. So that's number one. Um, Keep in mind, you all that's not the sell. The sell is, hey, I've been doing this for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. I, I love this. This is how I got into it. You know, I was a high school athlete and I, gosh, I wish I would have had somebody there to mentor me and to coach me. And so there's always the why. But then at some point you say, and by the way, my price, uh, you know, is commiserate with my experience and my passion towards what I do. I'm a professional. So that's number one. Secondarily, um, you know, the challenge with producing products is that at some point the 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 tires hit the pavement, right? And you got to either get a licensing deal or you got to launch it on your own. Licensing deals are pretty cool. However, you have very little power and control when it's a licensing deal. I'll just I and I don't want to get in the weeds on this because 
and I don't want to divulge good and bad deals, but you know, mm-hmm. there's good licensing deals and there's bad licensing deals. And trust me, I've had both. <laughs> and the bad ones keep you up at night and give you gray hair and and give you cortisol throughout your system. The good deals, I'll give you, a, let me talk about the good deals. The good deal I have is with Golf Forever Swing Trainer. The Golf Forever Swing Trainer is an iteration of the TRX Rip Trainer. It's an asymmetrical loaded bar, but we've marketed towards golfers. We've added an app so that you can train with you know high-level strength coaches like myself and other golf pros. And it's more geared towards golf. We've got a myopic focus on it. Now, can you use it if you're a hockey player, baseball player, tennis player, any fitness enthusiast? Of course. But we market it towards golf. And it's just an outstanding licensing deal. I mean, uh, it's the first time I've gotten a check in the mail and kind of gone, oh, well, that's going to do something. You know, like I can actually, you know, make some home improvements. I can, you know, pay my mortgage for the next six to eight, nine months. I can get some, you know, save some money for my kid's college fund, which are all viable things. Like as a strength coach in the industry for 30 years, I should be able to make some money. Um, Now, the challenge is sometimes you get some bad licensing deals. And if you end up going to court on a bad licensing deal, well, guess what? They might have a corporate attorney on staff you got to hire one at 400 bucks an hour to fight in court for countless hours and start doing the math on that. It's a fight you don't want to have. And so you kind of lick your wounds sometimes and you walk away. Now, my latest product, I'm going to launch on my own. I'm taking a leap of faith. I, I've got really good confidence in this product. It's timely. It fits a niche. I love glute training. Um, I've learned a lot of stuff, lessons from the past. And so I'm seeking investment capital right now, not from venture capital fund groups that will you know, take your hide, but from angel investors. Again, I've worked in the industry for years. I've got some friends and clients that love me that, you know, they're not just cutting blank checks, but, you know, they'll, they'll give me a hundred grand here or there. And I can kind of prove the concept and then I can go look for m- more money. Once you've proven your concept and if you sell all your inventory and you're on social media and you're up and rolling and people love it. It's not that hard to get money because people go, oh, I'm going to get in on the floor. It's a great investment and I can get, you know, five, 10 X on my return. So, but it's also a challenge because now it's on me. I'm the captain of the ship, right? I got to steer the thing. I got to create content. I got to launch the website. I got to get product liability insurance. I got to oversee manufacturing. I got to get distributors. I got to, you know, do quality control at, at the kit, you know, fulfillment warehouse. Like I have to do all that stuff. But you know, that's what I'm doing now. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not just a physical therapist and strength coach. I, you know, I don't care that I didn't go to Columbia and get a business degree. I certainly didn't go to get an uh, MBA at Stanford, but I'm, you know, I've got some knowledge. I've got some experience. I've got some wisdom. I can learn new things. And I've taught myself how to be a businessman. And I think it's a great lesson for coaches out there. Just because you didn't go to Columbia doesn't mean you can't learn about business and do business. If you're organic and authentic and you and you've got some mojo, some work ethic and passion, you know, immerse yourself in there, go out and change the world, do something bold. Yeah, Pete, you're right. And and we uh, we have so many resources now too, right? In terms of learning. Like I can I can learn about I'm right now I'm learning about uh I'm I took this course called the product launch formula. So I'm going through this thing like I'm listening to his book. I did every call. I am I'm re rewatching everything. I'm going with my coach to go over the things that I learned. You know, you once you dive into something, you'd be surprised because I actually had this conversation with Kevin Carr and Brendan Rick last week about that. I'm on their podcast as a guest, and they were they were asking me about just all of the different things that I've done in terms of you know strength coach podcast, strength conditioning webinars, hockey strength conditioning dot uh, com, and and having a facility and and the confidence to really uh, try these new things. And I really bring it back to this idea about a growth mindset because. I understand. And you said it, you said, I, I feel confident. I can learn something I could teach, you know, I could go out and learn to be, to do this and to do that. So I think that gives you the confidence to say, no, I'm, I'm going to try it. And you certainly have the experience where you've been there. And now you're like, no, I'm going to try to do this part on my own now, because I feel like uh, it's time. And, and I think uh, I, I just love that. But I want to ask you though, 
how do you control similar to your programming, right? Like here you are, somebody might be listening and be like, what is this guy a, a therapist? Is he a trainer? Is he an inventor? Is he an artist? What is, what is Pete doing over there? You know? So how do you kind of reel some of that? In? Especially a guy like I know, again, you're, you know, you bring a lot of energy to what you're doing all to everything you're doing. Um, how do you kind of reel in that brand and building your brand as Pete Holman? It, it is a great analogy to strength and conditioning, right? Because you have to build your capacity. And there's a there's always a risk to reward scale that's in, in flux. When I launched the Ripcore FX, um, I was a little cocky and confident. I said, this is the greatest tool. You know, that was the asymmetrical training bar that became the TRX Rip Trainer. I said, I, you know, this is so great. I've got these athletes using it. Virgin Active is on board. And, and I started telling some of my high fluting clients, well, I can't see you this week because I got business and I can't do blah, blah, blah. The next thing I know, I started weaning away some of my clients. And then the economic collapse happened and things changed in my personal life. We were upside down on a mortgage because in 2008, 2009, the real estate market turned on its head. And if I'm sure there's some people listening out there that got caught in that. And you know the visceral feeling that I have in my in my in my gut when I talk about this. Uh, long story short, I totally misjudged the the risk to reward scale, and I lost my house. I mean, I, let me repeat that: I lost my house, and that's not figuratively speaking; that is literally. Uh, so there wow. there always has to be a balance. But one of my favorite terms is a side hustle, right? In business, and you, you know, you listen to Brendan Bouchard or whoever talk about uh, you know business. You got to have some kind of a side hustle, if for anything, just to kind of keep you stimulated and keep you motivated and have a project to work on that's a little outside the nine to five. So you start a side hustle and, you know, there might be some long weekends in there. There might be uh, some late nights in there. But what are you going to you know, say on your deathbed, right? That, gosh, I always had that one idea. What if I would have just kind of gone for that one idea? Would my life have been different? Would I've been able to positively impact more people out there? Would I have, you know, really left a legacy and made my kids proud of me? And, you know, not that it's about that, but, you know, doing something greater. And so my my attitude has always been one of self-actualization. And it's not different than a growth brain mindset, but it's one of when I look back on my life and I'm I'm literally, you know, talking to my family and saying goodbye to people, I kind of want to have done it all. I want to have be fulfilled in, in that, you know, I want, you know, one point, this was 20 years ago, I said, you know, I practiced guitar when I was 16, right? I got a little, my mom got me this Ibanez white guitar. I thought it was Jimi Hendrix. And three months later, I got my driver's license, right? Maybe I was 15 and a half and I got my driver's license and I sold my guitar to get a 67 Ford Mustang. Now, at the time, that was a brilliant idea. I mean, I had never come up with a better idea in my whole entire life. Pretty good but idea. <laughs> in, in retrospect, like, had I been playing guitar since I was 16, I would be Eddie Van Halen right by now. And so 20 years ago, on my 30th birthday, I said, you know what? I'm going to Guitar Center. I'm buying a white guitar, and I'm going to learn how to play guitar. And I still suck, okay? But I'm a lot less suckier than I was 20 years ago. And now I can call myself a guitar player. And so that's kind of the thought process I have is as far as being, being a growth brain mindset, being a renaissance man or woman, trying to explore things in life that, that you're passionate about, that you're excited about. And it makes us much more interesting people. I mean, think about having a conversation with a, a person that you're interested in dating or marrying or whatever. And, and all they do is they're nine to five. Or they're just immersed in one thing and one thing only. It's, you know, that's great. But wouldn't it be neat to have some other interests and, and to have some pursuits? And I'm here to tell you, you can do it both. But you also have to just manage that risk to reward. Don't lose your house, please, people. Don't lose a relationship. Don't, you know, d don't be the, the cats in the cradle song, you know, where you never see your kid's baseball game. Like, I would never sacrifice that stuff. But if it means I'm a little tired one one day or if it means... I'm going to miss a workout. I can't tell you how many workouts I missed, but that's my private sanctuary. And I missed so many workouts. But now for the first time in my life, Anthony, 
I have, I just moved from Aspen to Denver, Colorado. I have quit all my personal training practice, which I've done for 30 years and my physical therapy practice. And I'm full time a fitness product inventor. I support three products, the Nautilus glute drive, the escape barrel. If you're looking for loaded carries, sled push, retro drags, uh, this, this is the product for you. And um, the Golf Forever Swing Trainer. So I've got three products in circulation that I'm getting royalties on. And that now, all that work, years of effort has now been able to fund me for my latest product where now I can focus full time on, you know, supporting the three products I have in circulation and creating or iterating and innovating my latest product. So it's it's a worthwhile venture and I'm having fun. I don't know if you can hear my voice like I'm not like. I love seeing clients. I love one-on-one. I will always help develop adolescent athletes. Um, Right now I'm doing business coaching with high school kids. Like that's a a newfound, it's almost a little cooler than, than athletics. Like it's something new and novel for me and it challenges me. And I, and part of me also thinks, what if I had had a coach when I was 16 or 17 that talked not just about athletics, but about business about the opportunities, about financial stability, about how to manage your money. Like, so (laughs) the point is, you know, follow your passion, follow your bliss, manage your expectations, make sure you've got capacity to do it, but get that side hustle going like yesterday. And I'm telling you, it's going to help embellish your life. Yeah. And and the side hustle, I mean, like this right now, our conversation, this is a side hustle that I started 15 years ago, right? I mean, I monetized it from day one. It's why I've been able to kind of keep going with it. Uh, and and it's been, a, and it's led to other things. But in the beginning, I really did dive deep. And, you know, don't forget, that was 16 years ago when I started getting into podcasts. Nobody I mean, was you know, doing podcasts. Yeah, nobody was ago. doing it. The resources weren't as easy now as it was. It was a lot harder to do. Um, but I just kind of stuck with it, found a way to do it and, and, you know, and it lasted. And, but like, again, going back to what you were talking about is like, it's really this idea of this growth mindset and, you know, understanding and learning and, and understanding and cause what you just said, you evolve, like, it doesn't mean you hate working training. It's like, you start to evolve and you get new passions when you have that growth mindset, you learn about different things and now you can try different things. And that's really what leads you to kind of being a little bit happier, in my opinion. Like, that's what I'm doing, trying to do now with, you know, my my personal stuff with 50 for 50. So, you know, I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm trying everything I can right now to do it, right? Well, and let's face it, you know, what we do and have done, this is one thing I admire so much about Mike Boyle is, like, how does this dude, he's still doing it, what he's done for freaking his entire life. I don't, I mean... My joints hurt. I'm tired. I can't go into the gym at 6 a.m. and, you know, have a 10, 12 hour day. Like, I just physically can't do that anymore. And so, what happened to me, part of pushing towards alternative revenue streams and developing other business ideas, is that I felt I wasn't as efficient and effective doing what I love doing. And when, and as soon as I started to notice my energy levels, you know, the last client comes in, right? And this is over COVID. So I'm up in Aspen. All the gyms are shut down, right? You can't go into a gym, which, by the way, is the most asinine thing I've ever heard. In, a, in an era where people are dying because they're unhealthy, let's close down the gyms, keep the pot shops, keep the alcohol distribution distributors open, and keep McDonald's open, but let's shut down the gyms. Anyhow, so now I'm out on the turf field in Aspen. Now, if you've never been to Aspen, it's 8,000 feet. So when it's cold and rainy, it's it's not just a little cold and rainy. It is nasty. When it's hot and sunny, it's not just a little hot and sunny. You're exposed to this UV radiation. So imagine being, you know, in your early 50s. You're, you're all fired up. You got the music on. You got your little portable gym out there by the turf field. It's pretty. It's beautiful. There's red tail hawks flying overhead. Everything's great. I see my first client. Woohoo! Let's go. Second client. All right. Hey, good to see you, Bob. Third client. Like, hey, Sally, how's it going? By the end of the day, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I don't know how people do it. Well, the the way they do it is they're 32 years old, right? You can't be doing this stuff for the rest of your life. So if you're in your late 20s, if you're in your 30s, even if you're in your 40s, you know, I was kind of a badass at 40s still. 
you could kind of get away with it. But at some point, you are going to be 50. And you don't want to be standing on the you know, sun-exposed turf field in Aspen, Colorado for seven, eight clients in a row when you're 50 years old. So it, it some of it's out of necessity, right? Like you just, this is a young man and woman's game and you got to have some alternative stuff going on. Absolutely. Good stuff. Well, Pete, I've taken enough of your time. It's been so great. I just, I love this whole uh, this process. I love, you know, kind of your background and, and how everything really melded together and how the products came about and, and that whole process, which is amazing. And, uh, really what you're doing, you're doing such great things in the industry. You're helping so many, not only the end user, but you're helping so many trainers. So I really appreciate you coming on a long time coming. And, uh, thanks again for doing this. Can't I can't thank you enough. And, you know, I'll leave with this. Bruce Lee was a huge icon of mine growing up. And I didn't get into martial arts, by the way, till I was 21. I, but I, I just always loved Bruce Lee. And he has a famous quote. He says, in any passionate pursuit, the pursuit counts more than the object being pursued. Now, this is an old Confucius type saying, but think about that. The pursuit counts more than the object being pursued. So always know what your why is to doing what you're doing. If you're connected to your why, if you're passionate about your why, if you're bought into your why, you're going to do special things in the world. All right, that's going to do it for episode 348 of the Shrank Coach Podcast. Guys, remember, you can try the new shrankcoach.com out for seven days for free. Totally new format, same great forum as always. It's the place where top coaches in the industry come to connect and learn. Go to shrankcoach.com, click the Join Now button to get started on your free seven-day trial. Special thanks to Chris Parrier and the folks over at Perform Better. Don't forget the holiday sale, 40% off racks, benches, bands, sandbags, cleaning supplies, you name it. Also, the one-day seminars are back in January. They'll be in New Jersey, Austin, L.A., Chicago, and Boston. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Pete Holman for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement and product development. Check out the anniversary interview I did with Coach Boyle, 40 Mistakes, 40 Years. There's a link to access that interview at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Thanks to Nomly, helping build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. Go to nomly.com, use the referral code strengthcoach to get started on your free 30-day trial. Thanks to Vince Gabriel and Kiss Marketing. If you need some help with your marketing, head over to kissmarketing.net to book a free coaching call with Will Matheson, Vince Gabriel's secret marketing weapon. kissmarketing.net to book your free coaching call. Thanks to Nico Ouellette and Perch. Perch is a 3D camera-based weight room technology solution. Bring in VBT into the 21st century. Head over to perch.bit slash coach to find out more about it. They have some great videos showing the cameras and how to use it. Thanks to Athletic Greens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash strength coach to get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. My name's Anthony Rana. Check out the show notes at continuefit.com or strengthcoachpodcast.com. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for listening and I'll speak to you next time.